Thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our home. Uh, tonight, um, the lecture will deal with it. This will be the last lecture we'll have until after Sukkot. So I think it's sort of, this will be at least three weeks that we won't have a lecture. Um, so this last lecture before, the, again, the Yom Hadin, before Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot time. So it's called Practical Tips for the Holiday. So I would like to begin this week's My Thought with a true story. The story begins with an Orthodox Israeli family. They were stranded in Tel Aviv. They had just missed their bus to Yerushalayim. It was Friday afternoon and, and just hours before the beginning of the Shabbat. And they were standing at the curb in front of the Tel Aviv bus station. It just so happened that a 17-year-old secular Israeli saw them and he asked them if they needed some help. The father told the young man that they had missed the last bus and they needed to be home in, in Yerushalayim before sunset. So this young Israeli offered to drive the family to their home and the father quickly accepted his gracious offer. Well, they reached their home just a little bit before the Shabbat was about to enter and the young man was about to leave. But the father invited him to spend the Shabbat with himself and his family. Well, at first the young man politely declined but the father kept insisting, and finally the young man agreed and he, to spend the Shabbat with this Orthodox Jewish family in Yerushalayim. He stayed for the whole Shabbat. He even participated in what we call Malava Malka, a traditional meal that's eaten after the end of the Shabbat. The words translate to mean, Malava Malka, to escort the Shabbat queen as it departs for another week. As the young man was leaving, he turned to his host and he said that the Shabbat experience had been wonderful, really something special. He said to the host that maybe he could suggest one small mitzvah, one small mitzvah that he could perform as a remembrance of this Shabbat. But he quickly added that he did not want to do some mitzvah that his secular friends would chide him about. The host thought for a moment and then a big smile appeared on his face and he said, you know, I have the perfect mitzvah for you to do. He said that in the code of Jewish law, the Shulchan Aruch, it states that when one puts on their tie shoes, they should first put on their right shoe, since the right side is an allusion to kindness. Then they should put on their left shoe, since the left side alludes to severity. Therefore, we always show preference to the right over the left. However, when it comes to tying our shoelaces, we reverse the order, and we tie our left shoe first, and then our right. This is an allusion to the mitzvah of tefillin, which we tie on our left hand. When, when we remove our shoes, what we do is just reverse the order. The young man smiled, and he said, perfect. So from that day on, this young secular Israeli began putting on and taking off his shoes in the richly prescribed manner. There were times, of course, that he would forget, but he would then take off his shoes and start all over again. He made every attempt to follow this procedure religiously. Sometime later, he was drafted into the Israeli army. One day, while he was in basic training, his platoon was on the parade field waiting for a helicopter to take them on maneuvers. He realized that he had put on his combat boots in the wrong order. He wanted to correct his error without drawing any attention. And so he told his captain that he had a migraine hat headache and that he needed to go back to the barracks so that he could take some aspirin. The captain told him to hurry back since the helicopter was due any moment. So the young soldier hurried to the barracks, removed his boots, and then put them on properly. By the time he had returned to the parade field, his platoon had already left. That day, Rahman al Islam, that God should protect us, two Israeli helicopters collided in midair, killing all 73 Israeli soldiers on board. Today, the same young Israeli soldier is an Orthodox Jew, married and living with his family in Yerushalayim. I find it interesting that we know certain things and even talk about them, but do we connect the dots? Recently, I realized that when I put on my workout sneakers, <clears throat> I, I don't bother untying them. I just slide my foot in or out of the sneak whenever I want to put them on or take them off. It seems like I've been doing this for a long time. 
Then it finally dawned on me <laughs> that here I had an opportunity to perform a mitzvah, and I was ignoring it. So now, when I put on or take off any shoes that have laces, I make it a point to tie and untie them properly. Yes, it's a small mitzvah. But as we see in the story, even a small mitzvah can protect a person and even save a person's life. So during this time of the year in the month of Elul and just before Yom Hadin, the Day of Judgment, what other small mitzvot can we observe or polish? It's not that these mitzvot should not be observed all through the year. It's just that we should try to be especially careful with the, with the performance of all of our mitzvahs during this propitious time. Of course, our hope should be that by placing more emphasis on these mitzvot now, that it may help us to continue to observe them better in some way after the holidays, what we refer to as tshuva, repentance. Another mitzvah opportunity that many of us miss is saying amen after we hear someone recite a blessing, whether it is a blessing said in a synagogue or even in the privacy of our home. Whenever we hear a blessing recited, we should make a concerted effort to answer amen. Now the word amen spelled alif, mem, and nun is an acronym for achila, eating, mamon, money, and niuf, sexual improprieties. Also, when we hear the Kaddish recited in the synagogue, we should never miss saying the words, Yehei Shemei Rabba Mevarak Le'olam Olomei Omayya. May his glorious name be blessed forever and eternity. The Talmud tells us that if a person recites these words with deep and proper intent, that they can earn themselves a place in Olam Haba in the world to come. <laughs> Imagine that. Every time we hear a blessing recited, we have an opportunity to answer Amen, which is like finding a precious diamond. How many times are we in the synagogue and Kaddish is being recited and we begin a conversation with a friend or, or we take out our cell phone? In the meantime, we have missed all those Amens that were offered, all of those diamonds. We need to be smart. We need to be greedy and reach out to grab as many of those Amens as possible. After all, they are all truly diamonds. We need to show the same camaraderie outside the synagogue as we do during services. Somehow, while we, are, while we should be praying, we have all kinds of important discussions that we have to have with our friends. Then once we leave the synagogue, <laughs> somehow it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. When we are in the synagogue, the only person that we should be talking to is God Almighty Himself. All of us, Abba Tisro, all of our love of our fellow Jews should be displayed as we go about our daily lives. Everything in its time and everything in its place. You know, the Messiah Yeshurim states that a person's face is a Rishut HaRabim, a public domain. You have no idea what a difference a smile and a simple hello or good morning can make in a person's life. You know, I recently heard a story from an article published in The New Yorker. The story was told by a Jerome Mato, a forensic psychologist, so psychologist who works for the San Francisco Police Department. One of his duties was to investigate the death of those individuals that had jumped from the Golden State Bridge. He had investigated hundreds, hundreds of these jumpers. This was done to ascertain whether they jumped or whether they were pushed off the bridge. The job had become more or less routine, and he, adjusted, he just adjusted himself to it. He was called to investigate the case of a man who had jumped to his death from the bridge. The man had ID on him, and so he went to the person's home to see if he had left a message, which he found was the case in most suicides. When he entered the apartment, he found a note on the dresser. The note read, I am on my way to the bridge to kill myself. If even one person greets me on the way, I will turn around and come home. One person. Just one person. One person saying hello could have saved this man's life. Little things in life can make such a difference in the lives of others. When you smile at another person, it's like a candle, which has the ability to light other candles. Imagine if all Orthodox Jews just smiled. Not only would it change the world, but I believe 
that it would usher in the coming of the Messiah. As the sages tell us, that the second temple was destroyed for the sin of sinat chinam, baseless hatred. Rabbi Yochanan Zakkai, great sage, lived to a ripe old age. He was asked, to what did he attribute his longevity? He answered that it was his custom to always be the first to greet everyone he met, Jew and non-Jew alike. Smile, greet people, be nice. As it says, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. Yes, this is a time of judgment. However, the judgment that we face is not quantitative, it's qualitative. There are individual mitzvot that we perform that may seem very insignificant, yet they can outweigh many of our transgressions. The opposite is also true. There are individual transgressions which may outweigh many of the mitzvot that we perform. The judgment is made by God Almighty Himself. He alone knows how to evaluate a merit against the transgression. You know, the Rambam states in Hilchot Shuvah, every person should view themselves in the entire world during the entire year as half meritorious and half guilty. Therefore, if they commit one sin, they thereby tip the scale of guilt for themselves and at the same time the entire world, thereby bringing destruction on themselves and on all the world's inhabitants. On the other hand, if they perform one mitzvah, huh, then they tip the scale of merit, not only for themselves, but also for the whole world, bringing about salvation and deliverance, not only for themselves, but also for the world and all of its inhabitants. So at least during this time of the year, all of us should make a concerted effort to pray with the minyan, a quorum of 10 men. We should also attempt to be early when we attend. Coming in late takes away some of the beauty of the experience. You are constantly playing catch-up. You really have little or no time to connect any thoughts with the words that you recite. You might as well be a parrot. Just coming five minutes early could make a big difference in your prayers and in your life. After all, we are asking God Almighty to extend himself for us. Isn't it only proper for us to extend ourselves for him. If you find it difficult, well, that's great. As the states in Pirkei Avot, Ben Hei said, the Fitzara Agra, according to the difficulty, is the reward. You know, this should be a time when we concentrate on Hakorat HaTov, a recognition of good. Not just saying thank you with your lips, but a true acknowledgement of the kindness that any other individual perform for you. We can learn our lesson from Moses, our teacher. When God brought the plagues on the Egyptians, Moshe did not participate in the first three plagues, which were brought from the water and the land. But why not? Hakoratatov, a recognition of good. The water had floated his cradle when his sister Miriam placed it in the Nile, and the land had buried the Egyptian taskmaster, whom Moshe had killed. Moshe felt that it would be seen as a lack of gratitude if he were to be instrumental in striking the water and or the land with a plague. When examining this scenario, one has to realize that the water had floated Moshe's cradle when he was only three months old. Moshe was 80 years old when he brought the plagues on Egypt. 80 years had since passed, and yet he still felt a sense of gratitude to the water and also to the land. So we learned two important lessons from Moshe's actions, or lack of. First, that once someone or something has done you a favor, you are indebted to them for life. And secondly, we have to ask, what did the water and land do special for Moshe? The answer is nothing. The water and land just did what they were created to do. They did nothing special for Moshe, and yet, yet he still felt a debt of gratitude to them. We learn a great lesson Moshe's lack of action, that we should never take for granted any kindness that anyone performs for us. We should always say, thank you. Even if someone is paid to service, such as a bus driver, 
a doorman or a beggar in a supermarket. Still, that does not relieve us of our obligation to say thank you. You know, even if someone just keeps the door open for you, we have an obligation to acknowledge that person's kindness. So how are you doing at saying blessings before or after you eat or drink anything? To me, it seems that the beginning blessing that we state is like saying please, and the after blessing is like saying thank you. Personally, I find that I always seem to remember the beginning blessing. Please just somehow seems to come easier. If I were asked as to whether I said the beginning blessing or not, I would almost always be able to answer in the affirmative. The problem that I find is with the after blessings. There are times when I ask myself, did I say the blessing or not? That being the case, I've tried to devise some strategy so as to remember. Here's what I've adopted as a strategy to remember whether I did or did not recite an after blessing. Now the grace after meal, what we refer to as the benching, is really not much of a problem since it is so long. It's easy to remember if I recited it or not. However, the blessing we make after cake, wine, or one of the five fruits that the land of Israel is praised for in the Torah, what we loosely refer to as the alamichia, I find a little more difficult to remember. I know the blessing by memory, and so I would many times recite it from memory. What I found was that there were times when I would say the blessing and then later not be certain whether I did or not recite it. In addition, since all blessings except for the grace after meal are rabbinic, which means that when in doubt, one cannot repeat them. So to ensure that I really said the prayer, I now make it a point to only say the Alamilchia blessing <clears throat> excuse me, by opening the app in my cell phone. That is enough of an action for me to be certain that I did or did not remember to recite the prayer. Then there's the blessing we recite after almost everything else that we eat or drink. <clears throat> excuse me, is referred to as the Borei Nefoshot. My solution to remember as to whether I recited this blessing or not is to sing a song that I composed. Borei Nefoshot Rabot V'chesronon Al kol ma shibirasal hakios bahem nefesh kol koi borachei ha'olamim. By the way, you can find it on my website, on base-mordechai.com, with all my other songs that I've read done. Now, this song forces me to articulate all the words of the blessing properly, and in addition, it reminds me to recite the blessing. You know, if I don't remember singing the song, then I know that I didn't recite the blessing. Then there's the blessing that we recite when we exit a bathroom called the Asher Yotzar. Remembering whether I recited this blessing or not is a little easier since it is recited immediately after one exits the bathroom. Blessings after eating are a little more of a challenge since we can be sidetracked more easily after we finish eating or drinking. There's really no definitive ending. Connecting to all these blessings allows us to say please and thank you to our benevolent Father and King. What parent doesn't appreciate good manners? Serving God properly is much like anything you see as important in your life. We cannot leave it up to chance. We need to focus not just on the act that we perform, but also on the words that we recite. After all, we are addressing them to our Father, our King. There should never be any question as to whether we thanked Him or not. Now, all of these suggest suggestions are, are some of the basic requirements of serving God and showing Him that we appreciate all that He bestows upon us. We acknowledge that all of our successes are gifts that He bestows upon us. All that we contribute is effort. We are called Yehudim, Jews. It's not an accident. All that we do, whether connected to man or to God, should make us grateful for all the kindnesses that we receive in this world. And with that thought in mind, let us hope and pray for the greatest gift of all, with the coming of Mashiach Sukeno, now. So I'm blessing you and yours with Aksiva Chasim Atova may be written and inscribed only for good. Stay happy, stay healthy, successful, and safe. Again, may God bless you with the holidays this year and next year. May we celebrate them all in Yerushalayim and Al-Kodesh in Jerusalem with the Mashiach Sukain. Again, thank you for attending. 
Enjoy the holidays. Make a connection. Do something. Change something. Connect in some way. And I guarantee you that you'll feel better for it, and so will God. Thank you for listening.